Hello everyone. Today is gosh, March 7th of 2022 and I'm here with public health expert Lois Pace. And Lois, I'm actually going to turn this over to you if you could just briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and kind of what you have been working on regarding pandemic response. Well, um, as you said, my name is Lois. I'm the Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs here at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, before stepping into this position about a year ago, I was running a nonprofit organization uh, that was essentially an advocacy coalition for a range of global health issues. Um, so that kept me quite busy, um, particularly uh, once the pandemic started, but even beforehand. Um, and leading into uh, coming into government, I served as a member of the then president elect's COVID-19 transition advisory board. Uh, I played that role with a handful of other people, uh, really uh, consulting the president and vice president elect on their agenda coming into office to end the pandemic. Yeah, that, that's incredible to hear. So kind of specifically looking back in December of 2019, what were you doing then? And then how has your role shifted to, you know, combat the spread of COVID-19 that began in more of this spring of 2020? December 2019, I was doing things that one often does at the end of a year. In my case, running an organization that was trying to do a, quite a bit of closeout. Um, I don't think that we had gotten much word of anything brewing uh, in Asia or otherwise, although coming into the new year, that certainly um, was uh, more a part of various global health discussions and circles. Uh, I found myself even attending a global health conference in Asia where I think the sensitivities were quite heightened. Uh, and so that's a really poignant time for me because it was a time when many of us were asking what was happening and whether we should be preparing ourselves for something quite bad um, and something that many of us have feared um, for for a while. Yeah, no, that that's so interesting to hear. And then kind of when COVID reached, you know, the US soil in the spring of 2020, could you talk maybe about how your job or position might have shifted or kind of maybe speak about you know, what advocacy or efforts you were taking to, to help combat the spread? Certainly, I, I would say our jobs and our outlook even changed before it was really clear what the U.S. was facing because my role has always been globally facing or at least for the past decade or two. Um, so a lot of us here in Washington, D.C., where my team was based and many of the organizations I supported at the time were based, were really wondering, OK, well, what does this mean for the work that we do um, and for our staff doing that work right, all over the world? And what does it mean for us here at home? And so, as I mentioned, a lot of the work that I was focused on was not just about pandemics or infectious diseases even. Um, a lot of that work involved um, maternal and child health programs or non-communicable diseases, in addition to other diseases that we hear more about, or at least we heard more about before COVID came along, uh, like HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. And so I found myself really having a lot of discussions with the global health community here in Washington, and also the global health community in other parts of the world who made it their business to advocate for these programs and to ensure that we were doing our best to advance global health. Um, but we were saying, okay, well, this is really a global health emergency that's upon us. And so what do we need to do um, to ready ourselves um, for for the worst uh, or for something quite jarring to our work. I think that people were hopeful that we were preparing for the short term. Um, certainly looking now at how we're 
in year three of the pandemic. That wasn't something that was discussed back then. And I think people were, were pretty much putting faith in the fact that we had the tools to respond to a global health emergency. And I think hopeful that policymakers and the general public, not to mention practitioners, would take the steps required to ensure that we could contain this. So that, that was a lot of what I did, was to talk about, okay, what should this emergency response be among us? And what are the resources required to be sure we can do that? And that meant turning our eyes to policymakers in the US Congress or in parliaments around the world, in addition to really looking to WHO to advance the way forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much for that perspective. And then kind of looking at how you further transitioned to being a member of President elect uh, Joe Biden's. COVID-19 advisory board, and then now you're kind of working within the Department of HHS. Could you, could you describe a little bit more about what you're doing within those roles? Yeah, it's very interesting to, to then transition from an organization or as an individual who was really kind of working from the outside in and looking to government to take action. And now I am a part of said government uh, and I have the influence or authority to take the very actions that I was one seeking as an advocate. So uh, coming into working with um, the president and others in this administration, I think it, it took me a, a second um, to recognize the, the power that I had. And the certainly I, I was clear um, at that point that that came with a, a good deal of responsibility. Um, so starting in, I guess it would have been the fall of 2020, I hadn't quite anticipated the ways that I could use my voice to this end uh, and specifically lift up the actors doing this work and the actions they were taking to make a difference. That was one way that I really saw my role, particularly on the global front. And it's a lot of questions have been swirling about the value of an organization like WHO or the work that CDC does, not just at home, but abroad. Not to mention the millions of individuals or organizations or thousands of organizations, I should say, who were really tackling COVID on the front lines and what that, what that looked like, what that felt like in other parts of the world. We could see the pictures of what was happening here at home, but I'm not sure that everyone had a clear understanding of how we were having a shared experience worldwide. And that will, I think that will always sit with me, uh, how First, the world was essentially brought to its knees, of course, but how that was so commonly felt. Now we can talk certainly about how that was inequitably felt, right? Um, and there were different communities, different countries, but different communities within those countries even who felt or had this experience in a different way. But the reality is COVID didn't leave anyone alone, right? Uh, and so I took it quite seriously that I could shed some light on that part of the story. And I did that particularly as a member of the advisory board, but also worked with uh, incoming government officials to understand what we do with that information, right? So if the continent of Africa is wondering how it will be able to access supplies or innovations as they come uh, down the line, then we should have an answer to that. Or um, if people who have been doing public health work in Latin America or Eastern Europe for years are sort of sounding the alarm that AIDS or tuberculosis programs or reproductive health services are at risk, right? 
we should be paying attention to that and we should find some way to ensure that our response and investments in health services or systems take into account not just COVID, but these other issues that people on the ground are telling us need our support. So that was just a really important role it seemed I could play just in that short period of time, say November, December, January of 2020, and then to come into a formal position myself, really take on those and other recommendations, right? In the ways that I worked with some of those same institutions, many of those same governments or stakeholders. Yeah, well, th you know, thank you so much for sharing that. And kind of looking at how the scope of the pandemic has changed in terms of vaccinations and therapeutics and how you have had, you know, different roles to play since the beginning until now. Has that lands, could you speak at all about how kind of that landscape in terms of maybe equity or some of these other issues that you were um, touching on and kind of the changing therapeutics and, and vaccine? That's probably been more my focus in the past year than anything else is ensuring Okay, as the US and the world, frankly, responds to this collective need, how we ensure we're lifting all boats and lifting all boats at the same time, um, uh, ideally. Uh, and so, again, by way of example, you know, you had the US really experience some tough waves um, as a part of this pandemic. But you could see other countries like Brazil, like India. Um, also, um, if I go back to this time last year, experiencing similar waves and us asking ourselves what we could do to, to help, right? Um, knowing what we've all gone through and, and, and looking at what we could do. Um, so that was, that felt quite important to me. I really applaud the people who just do this work unseen and unsung. Uh, I'm in the Department of Health where we have individuals who are based in countries like Brazil and India and Mexico and Kenya and South Africa, who are sort of our early signals of what's happening on the ground and are working alongside government officials there uh, to understand what's bubbling up for them. And again, how we could support one another. Uh, and so that was important work to be doing until the administration could unveil a more formal strategy around how we support the world, particularly with vaccines, which then were, were made available. Um, so that's another, I suppose, milestone or um, key moment in my past year is the ways that early on the US was talking and thinking about how we, how we share vaccines with the world or how we otherwise support the, the development and availability of these products. Um, we knew that it, 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 it was critical that we found some sort of way to get the rest of the world there as soon as possible, not only from a public health perspective, obviously, but just in the spirit of being on the right side of history here. So that was significant, obviously, to really approach that strategy and that planning with, with care, but also with urgency. And it's pretty incredible to think that's something that we didn't begin doing as a country or weren't able to begin doing until spring of last year. And now we're, we're in March of 2022 and we're looking at having shared close to 500 million vaccines with over hundred countries. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing, right? Um, not to mention the investments that we've been able to make in countries or in institutions to develop these vaccines. But you asked earlier about things beyond vaccines, right? Treatments and tests. And there are still work to be done to ensure the rest of the world has access to 
these life-saving products. Not to mention, even when it comes to vaccines, we talk a lot about getting beyond products on planes and getting shots into arms and ensuring that people are actually vaccinated. Um, and we're not just thinking about shipping vials um, to different countries. We, we face the same challenges here though, right? I mean, we're still talking as a country about how we can ensure people are vaccinated, yes. And also with new treatments uh, coming down the pike, how we can test to treat, right? How we can, particularly for immunocompromised individuals or those at higher risk, we're really ensuring that we're reaching those with the least, with the most that we can do. And I think that applies here, but it also applies everywhere if, we're, if, if we have the capacity to help. Yeah, that, that is so important to hear about. And then kind of thinking ahead, what comes next for you? And what do you think these next six months are going to kind of look like? Well, I'd like to think many of us who've worked in public health and the international aspect of that, but just public health broadly, um, have certainly been aware of issues around disparities, but COVID has exacerbated that and validated all of that data, right? With real life to say, we're still not, we're still not doing enough, we're still not getting it right when it comes to health or many other issues we can say and ensuring we're not leaving people behind. And so that that has to still be something that I focus on. It's absolutely something I care about. And it's within my purview to do, right? I have the mandate. The president has given us this mandate. And as long as I'm in this position, I have permission to focus on that, let alone uh, a real passion for that that issue. And that entails not just ensuring we're reaching people who are historically and consistently left behind, uh, but we're, we're pulling them in as well, right? Because that's also something that's tried and true when it comes to any of this work, you know, any social service, any, anything that we claim to do uh, on behalf of others. And ideally we're doing it with others and we're ensuring that equity is not just something that we realize in our outcomes, but that we demonstrate through our process. And so something I hadn't really talked about, but that I also experienced and really tried to drive throughout this pandemic has been to make space for others, these faces and voices who are most affected, who now because of this virtual environment that we're in and also because it truly is taking all of us to solve this problem, they're breaking through for the first time in a very different way. Leadership from other countries, from other regions who have been shouting from the rooftops for years what they need, what, they, what they're doing, right? What they are capable of in terms of teaching the rest of us. And now we're finally listening. A different way ourselves and so it's my hope that that type of work continues that that doesn't go away as people start to feel more comfortable or more accustomed to what we've been living through um, some of what we've learned and done has to stay because it's it's better for us and that's certainly one of those things and that's not just relevant for COVID right we can now look to all of these other health issues or priorities and ask ourselves, well, how are we gonna close the gap in all of these other areas when it's come to women and girls or LGBTQI populations or people of historically marginalized ethnic and racial groups and communities. It's my goal that we press on this as long and as hard as possible because I never I never want to be here again, right? Not for COVID, but not for anything else really. And you know, as the saying goes, when you, you know better, you do better. 
And that's absolutely what I intend to do. Thank you so much for your time today. You are truly a champion for public health and your work and perspective is so incredibly important. So thank you so much for, for all of your contributions. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate you all doing this work yourselves and capturing the perspectives of so many who have done so much. I still think that there's so much more that I could be doing. Uh, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but I imagine that there are many of us who've been at this for as long as we have, wondering what else there is, right? And so um, as I look to the future and really think about that, um, you know, wanting to give us some credit for how far we've come um, and maybe cut us a little bit of slack for um, sort of learning while doing. Um, but I'm, I'm quite eager to do that much more and to ensure, you know, we're not taking too long to get it right.